Hello, arty peoples, and welcome to another episode of Jerry's Live. My name is Emmy Klein, and I'm your host this evening. And as you can see, I have a guest on the show. <laughs> now, uh, just side little little note here. Uh, very sorry. We are only live to YouTube right now because um, I think the equipment's a little mad that I've been gone at my residency for a while. So we're having a slight technical issues with that, but we're going to fix it and upload this video to YouTube or uh, to Facebook once it is done being aired so you guys can check it out there. But we have an amazing show planned with Jeff. Hello, everybody. Thank yes. you for having me. It's great to be here in person. It's so exciting. That means I also get to play with all the supplies that you're going to be showing us. We're going to have fun. We're going to do it together. It's going to be a lot of fun. So um, without further ado, I was going to hand it off to you. But uh, if you are interested in everything that Jeff is about to show us, uh, make sure to go to the website, jerrysartorama.com, and type in today's class code, which is JL267. And if you type that in the search bar, the teacher's cart should come up and show you everything that we're about to be playing with. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Take it away, Jeff. All right. Well, thanks again. Um, I've got a couple things uh, for us today. First, I'm going to start out with a PowerPoint presentation, uh, take us through a little bit of history of watercolors in general, and Very talk uh, specifically about Ecolina, uh, which is the product that we're featuring today. And we're going to have some fun showing the different techniques that you can get with the different types of materials, uh, including a brush pen, a marker, and of course the liquid watercolors themselves. So without further ado, let's go ahead and hit the presentation. Are you got no, one actually, more thing? I, one last thing, uh, you guys gotta make sure you pay attention. Well, that's because right. Because yep. we have a giveaway. A giveaway. So we're gonna have a quiz at the end. Yes. So I'm gonna be giving the PowerPoint plus the demonstration, and at the very end I'm gonna ask three questions. So we're gonna have three winners. And they're going to get their choice of the Ecoline liquid watercolor, the markers, or the duo tip, uh, excuse me, the duo tip markers and the brush pens. So yes. your choice. So, so lots of fun. So pay attention. It's my bribe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All, right, All right, let's go. So here's the presentation. So Ecolina. So this is how it's pronounced. I get asked this all the time. Uh, most often you will hear people in the U.S. say Ecoline. You'll hear me say that. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is the appropriate and correct pronunciation in Dutch. Ecolina, Ecolina. Uh, for future reference. All right, let's dive into a quick intro for Royal Talons. Royal Talons is the manufacturer of Ecolina. They are located in Appeldoorn in the Netherlands. It's about an hour east of Amsterdam by train. Uh, it's home to the Summer Palace, to the Dutch royal family, so a fun uh, anecdote there. And here you see in the back image the original building, uh, and we're still manufacturing on the same site. Of course, we've upgraded the building, right? Uh, but we're still uh, making the products in the same spot. In the top picture there, you can see the 1930s uh, factory floor with the steam-powered uh, paint mills, which is really cool. Of course, today everything's electric, right? But they used to have these big belts that would operate off these steam engines to power the mills. Um, product lines that Royal Talents manufactures, you're probably familiar with Rembrandt, which does Rembrandt oils and watercolors, and of course soft pastels are really well known in North America. We have Van Gogh oil watercolor pastels, uh, Amsterdam all acrylics, and of course Ecolina. Uh, a lot of folks ask, why are you called Royal Talents? You can see in the picture there, it just says Talents. Mm -hmm. You probably wondered yourself that, right? Yes. Why are they called Royal Talents? Well, I will tell you, uh, in the inset there is Queen Wilhelmina. Uh, she she looks was, like a queen. Doesn't she look yes. like a queen? Very, She's very, very regal. regal. Very regal. Also an art enthusiast herself, an amateur painter. Uh, and she bestowed the royal predicate upon Royal Talents in 1949 for our contributions to the uh, culture and economy of the Netherlands. Oh, cool. And so we have been royal ever since. I like it. And then one last thing on the company, in 2015 we established our affiliate here in North America. Now the products have been available since the 1930s, uh, but in 2015 we actually established our own warehouse, our own customer service center to better serve the artists of Canada and the U.S. So that's my bit. Uh, on Royal Talents, and you can uh, follow those website links there for more information. A uh, little information on myself, of course. I'm the Art Education Director for Royal Talents North America. Uh, I have an MFA and BFA in painting and drawing. I taught uh, university studio art and art history mm -hmm. uh, for a decade, and I've been in the art materials industry uh, for more than 20 years, and an exhibiting artist for more than 30. Yes, kind of dating incredible. myself there. 
incredible artist. You guys definitely have to go to his website there. Check it and out. Check there it, it out. is. So if you want to learn more art. about me, mm -hmm. uh, definitely visit uh, jeffwolsonart.com. All right, let's jump in today's agenda. So I'm going to give a super, super brief history on watercolors in general. Uh, I'm going to talk about the general composition of watercolors, uh, the binders, which are the unique uh, ingredients that give them their working properties. We'll talk a little bit about coloring agents, and that's really important as it pertains to Equilina specifically. Uh, because they're dye-based colors. And I'm going to talk about what the difference is between a dye-based color and, and pigments. Uh, and then we're going to talk specifically about the qualities of Aquilina. Uh, and then we've got our demonstration, of course, at the end, where we're going to have some fun. Nice. All right, so in the beginning. So um, people have been making art for millennia, right? Mm -hmm. That impulse to create has gone relatively unchanged. Uh, the images you see here uh, in France and Spain date back 15 to 30,000 years ago. In Australia, there's some images that date mm -hmm. back 60,000 years ago. In Zambia, 350,000 years ago. So we've been making art for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. Some of the art materials that were used back then have gone relatively unchanged, which is really cool. Uh, and then, of course, others have gone through incredible changes and continue to evolve today. Uh, so it, it's really important and has always been important to me to have some understanding of those origins, a greater appreciation where the materials come from and their history. I think it really plays into the meaning of what we do today as painters. Uh, so let's talk about watercolor in that context. It is a centuries old medium. Uh, dates back to Neolithic period, really if you want to get into the history of inks and watercolors, which are very closely tied together. Uh, but in Asia, in China specifically, watercolor has been around since 4000 BCE. And by the 4th century CE, uh, there was an established landscape watercolor tradition in China. Uh, in Europe, it was a little bit later. Uh, watercolor, of course, existed, but it wasn't until the invention of paper in the 11th century that Europeans really started to uh, look at watercolor as a viable medium for finished artwork. And in the top image here, you see a piece by Albrecht Dürer, who many of us are familiar with, uh, and he did some wonderful paintings, uh, landscapes, and this little still life here, I guess you can call it, is called Turf. He did it in 1503, and it's all with watercolor, and he did these really brilliant watercolors, really fascinating. Uh, then we jump ahead to the 18th century, and it's the golden age of watercolor in England, and in the middle picture there we see an image by Turner, very famous English painter, and uh, his watercolors are amazing. I'm still amazed yeah. by them today. The expressive quality, uh, and he really uses the medium to the full extent to, to really uh, create images that kind of sing of the atmosphere, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then we get to the 20th century, and here we have an image by probably the most popular or well-known watercolorist in North America, and that's George O'Keefe. Uh, and she really uh, exploited the expressive qualities of the medium uh, to the modern uh, uh, purpose. Uh, so there's my brief history on, on some of the artists and art traditions using watercolor over the centuries. Uh, real briefly, the history of Ecolina. So here are some of the original jars. So the product line was established in 1930. Uh, and I love it. There's actually, if you go to Appledorn, you can get a tour. Uh, and they have these wonderful old cases that show the history of all the products. And these are some of the first bottles here. Uh, and that was in the 1930s. Uh, Ecolina has been very popular with illustrators, with designers, uh, as well as fine artists throughout that period. In 2016, we introduced the brush pen, which we're going to use today, and then also the new bottle, which you can see pictured here as well. And then coming out this year is the new duo tip marker. Uh, and that's image uh, at the very bottom there. All right, so what is watercolor exactly? Yeah, so let's yep. talk about the composition. Uh, of course, we have a binder, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. So there's the binder and the coloring agent. Those are the two main ingredients in all paints, and they're unique to each paint uh, in terms of the binder. Coloring agents, though, are the same. So we use mm -hmm. the same pigments or dyes, for example, whether we're making oils, whether we're making watercolor, we're making acrylics. But the binders are all unique, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Along with those two things, other things can also be found in watercolors. Uh, you've got plasticizers. Uh, these are the ingredients that keep the paint from hardening in the tube, for example. Uh, they keep pans from cracking. Uh, and a very common uh, plasticizer is glycerin. 
Uh, humectants, uh, that's a fun word. I love just saying <laughs> that word, humectant. Uh, humectants uh, help the watercolors absorb moisture better, so especially mm -hmm. with pans. So when you add water, it helps them to absorb that. And honey has been a really popular humectant. Yeah. Uh, and then corn syrup is used often in the manufacture mm -hmm. that makes uh, sense. of watercolors. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, dispersants do just what they say. They're also referred to as wetting agents or flow enhancers. So they're what help the pigments or the dye to disperse through the water more rapidly and evenly. Uh, and there have been many different types. Uh, many of them are organic. Probably the most well known is ox gall, mm -hmm. uh, and that is just what it sounds like. <laughs> Yep, the gall of an ox. <laughs> the gall of an ox. Uh, so those are dispersants. Uh, we will also find extenders, um, sometimes referred to as fillers. So extenders can actually bulk up the paint mm -hmm. a little bit, and in student grade paints they're there to replace some of the pigments. Uh, dextrin is a very common extender used in the making of, of watercolors. And then finally preservatives. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the ingredients are organic, plus uh, because we're adding water from our tap often, there are different things that can enter bacteria, for example, or fungus. Uh, the most common types of uh, preservatives are fungicides, actually, oh. to keep fungus from growing. A very common one that's used a lot by artists in their studio is clove oil. Yep. Yep. I've had that as well. Yep. Yep. So that helps uh, the green goblin from growing mm -hmm. on your watercolor pan. Nobody likes a moldy watercolor pan. <laughs> All right, so that's the composition. So let's talk about the binder because it's so important in giving watercolors their unique characteristic. And the Ecolina have a 100% gum arabic binder in them. So gum arabic is a type of resin. Mm -hmm. comes from a tree called the acacia tree, which uh, grows uh, in sub-Saharan Africa primarily. Uh, and that's where most of the artist quality gum arabic comes from. Uh, a binder does a couple things specifically. It helps to uh, suspend the pigment uh, and to adhere it to a surface. So pigments don't dissolve, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, so they need to be suspended. And then we're painting on something, right? So it has to stick to the surface. Mm -hmm. so, so binders are typically really good adhesives. Uh, most paint binders also create a paint film, mm -hmm. uh, which hardens or dries. But gum arabic is very unique. It doesn't create a discernible paint film. It actually is absorbed into the surface of the paper, which is one of the reasons why watercolors are permeable, that we can lift the color even after it's dry. And move it around. There is no paint film, right? Mm -hmm. So gum arabic is very unique compared to other traditional paint binders for that reason. Uh, here you can see uh, the gum arabic up close and also the gum arabic being harvested off of wild acacia trees in Senegal. Uh, and somebody's saying, geez, is that the only thing that they use gum arabic for? Actually, no. That's a small group. Uh, it's a food additive in a lot mm -hmm. of things. I think colas use gum arabic. I believe so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's used for a lot of things. Uh, I think less than 3% goes to the making of artist materials. All right, so let's talk about the coloring agents. So we got the binder. Now we need some color, right? And dyes and pigments are traditionally the colors that we find in artist materials uh, for different reasons. And we'll do a comparison between the two here in a minute. But let's talk about their origin mm -hmm. because that's the fun story, right? <laughs> Where do these coloring agents come from? So we typically classify them as being either organic, inorganic, or synthetic. Mm -hmm. And organic uh, pigments are the plants or animals, right? And here are uh, two little guys, are very infamous, if you will, as coloring agents. There's cochineal beetles. Uh, they come from uh, Central America and South America. They grow on the bottom of a little cactus. They mm -hmm. breed on the bottom of a little cactus. And bugs. they are responsible for the color carmine. Really pretty bugs. Really pretty bugs. Yeah. They give their lives for the color <laughs> red and have been doing so for centuries. Um, we do not use these guys for the making mm -hmm. of artist materials any longer. We have a synthetic carmine that's much more durable and light fast, but they're still used as a food additive and what? they're used in cosmetics too. Ew. A lot, yeah. So the guys are <laughs> still in business. Yeah, no, all that red lipstick. <laughs> Little, be, little beetle, beetle blood uh, in, in those things. But, uh, it's just extra protein, right? Yeah, a little extra oh. protein. <laughs> uh, so that's an example of an organic pigment source. There are many others out there. Uh, the other group are inorganic pigments, and those are the mineral-based pigments. Mm -hmm. And some of the oldest pigments, the oxides, like yellow ochre, red oxide, uh, are mineral-based pigments. Uh, and this is probably one of the most famous. Mm -hmm. uh, and this stone is lapis. Uh, it's worth the same as gold by weight, and it's uh, found almost uh, 
only or exclusively in the mountains of Afghanistan. There are a few mm -hmm. other locations. Uh, and the name that we associate with this was given uh, by the Venetian traders, and it's Ultamarine. Ultamarine. Oh. It means from beyond the sea or over the sea. Okay. Uh, and so it was a very valuable pigment. Uh, only the uh, most successful artists, or at least the artists with a successful patron, mm -hmm. could afford to use it. The Catholic Church actually uh, dictated or had rules around its use. You could only use it for certain subject matters. Oh yeah, no, I remember uh, blue was definitely one of the very few colors that they found in, in the older right, paintings because right. it was such a hard pigment to find. Yep, yep, it was hard to make and, and this one was very exclusive and very valuable. Of course today we have a synthetic version mm -hmm. which is much less expensive and doesn't rely on lapis. Uh, so to our benefit that we can make that wonderful ultramarine blue. Now most modern pigments are synthetic pigments beginning mm -hmm. either as an organic or an inorganic. Uh, and then we cook them up, mm -hmm. uh, synthesize them, if you will, by exposing them to other chemicals or ingredients. We heat them sometimes. Uh, but it isn't something just from the modern era. Artists have been alchemists for centuries, always experimenting with their mm -hmm. materials. And one example, or one great example, is lead white. Lead white was the most popular white during the Renaissance. Uh, and uh, the way it was made is these coils of lead uh, were submerged in uh, little clay pots uh, with wine or with vinegar and then cow dung uh, or, or horse dung was packed around them to generate heat and what would happen is the lead would oxidize and form this white crust. So it began as an inorganic material and it's being cooked up if you will and this white crust was flaked off dried in the sun, ground up into the beautiful pigment for lead white. That was the most popular white all the way up until the, the 20th century. I just, I want to know the like the thought process between it, the, the artist that was like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take this <laughs> lead, we're going to put it in a pot, we're going to put some wine in there, we're going to pack <laughs> cow dung around it. It's just, it's, yeah, that's, you know a, that's so, a lot of process. <laughs> so interesting about a lot of these stories, it was by accident. Mm -hmm. You know, they were trying to do something else completely and ended up making something else completely different. Like the story of Prussian Blue was actually a, a Prussian chemist who was trying to make an artificial carmine, but oh. ended up making Prussian Blue, which became a popular color of it. It's of beautiful its own. color. So lots yeah. of examples. So who knows what happened to a piece <laughs> of lead. Somebody saw it, it fell in a bottle of wine and, and turned white, and they went, hey, wait a minute. I don't want to know where the cabinet <laughs> came from, though. <laughs> so those are some some of the stories, some of uh, just a few of the many great stories about pigments. Uh, and then what's the difference in a dye and a pigment? Well, a dye is essentially those pigments uh, where the uh, color has been cooked out of them uh, into a more fluid or soluble form. Uh, and we're going to talk about that on the next slide here. So dyes versus pigment. And the real difference of the definition is solution versus suspension. Okay. So dyes dissolve completely into the binder on a molecular level. Okay. So the best way to uh, describe it is like sugar or salt. When you put it into water and you stir it up, it dissolves completely. And that's what we call a solution. Okay. Pigments don't dissolve. They're like grains of sand, or since we're using sugar and salt, we can say pepper. Okay. You can stir it up and it'll disperse, but ultimately it'll either sink to the bottom or like pepper float to the top. So the binder has to suspend it or hold it in place. So one dissolves and one suspends, and that gives them different working characteristics. And let's go through those. So the first is adhesion. So how well does it stick to the surface? Since dyes literally bond with the binder, wherever the binder goes, the dyes go. Uh, so in this case, we have gum arabic and water as a vehicle. It gets absorbed into the surface of the paper. So okay. dyes get absorbed into the surface of the paper. Uh, they're like a staining watercolor. Gotcha. Uh, all the colors are that way. And so they really adhere to the surface well. You can lift them to a certain degree, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but pigments, they kind of rest on the surface. So they don't have the same strength of adhesion as a dye-based watercolor. Uh, lifting is on the side. So lifting is a technique that a lot of watercolor artists use. The paint can be dry on the surface, but you can go in with a, a wet brush and lift the color, sometimes almost completely, mm -hmm. especially with granulating colors. Uh, dyes are very difficult to lift. You can use it a little bit, uh, but uh, uh, pigments are definitely easier to do the lifting techniques with. And then we have luminescence, so how well does the color vibrate off of the surface, right? Uh, literally, luminescence is, is how much color we see without the use of generating heat. And what I mean by that is like every light around us is a type of heat. 
Okay. Uh, that's electricity is conducting through it to create this heat that's generating light that we see or radiates to us. So how much light does something uh, reflect or generate without the use of heat is its lumen or its luminescence. Okay. Uh, and so dyes have very high luminescence. Because they literally bond molecularly with the binder, they are so thoroughly distributed that they reflect a lot of light back at us. So we can really perceive the color really, really well from a dye, more so than with a pigment. Mm -hmm. Pigments still have little separations between one pigment and the other, and so even when they're finely ground, they still don't reflect or lumen as much as a dye does. And we have contrast, and contrast is much higher with dyes for the same reason. Mm -hmm. The same reason we have this great luminescence with dyes, we also have higher contrast. So the difference between our darks and our lights is going to be much more clearly observed in a dye-based color than it is in a pigment-based color. Color mixing is actually easier to do with dye-based colors and pigment-based mm -hmm. colors. Again, because it's completely dissolved, we get these great mixtures, whether we're blending colors, but definitely with optical mixtures as well. Right? That makes sense. Uh, yeah, exactly. And then finally, light fastness. Now this is definitely on the side of pigments, which is why pigment colors are preferred by fine artists who are creating work where they want the work itself to last for generations. Mm -hmm. uh, the benefit uh, of the dye side, even though it's not light fast, with the high contrast and luminous, it digitally reproduces super well. So when you're taking photographs of it, which is why it was favored by illustrators and designers Makes for so sense. many years, uh, you could really get a truer representation of the original work uh, when you're taking a photograph or a digital image of it. But light fastness definitely on the side of pigment. So those are some of the differences uh, in the working properties of paint made with dye versus a pigment. So dyes aren't necessarily bad, right? So a lot of people say, oh, it's made with a dye, it must be cheap, it must be no good. No, it just has a different set of working properties. Mm -hmm. And depending on your goals as an artist, they could be to your benefit. All right, so what is a liquid watercolor? Because I get asked that a lot, right? Yep. Uh, so let's kind of go through it here. Uh, so like inks, liquid watercolors are a solution. Okay. So we, we talked about how they dissolve completely, and that makes them different than tube watercolor or pan watercolor. I was going to ask, because yeah. when you say liquid, I mean, I'm just assuming that it's fluid and like has a, a wet quality to it and it's I, with tubed watercolors. Yeah, yes. It seems like it would be similar. The and the difference is that uh, level of solubility. Okay. So liquid watercolors are concentrated uh, and they are literally a solution versus that um, um, combination of pigment and binder. Mm -hmm. uh, suspension is the word gotcha. I was looking for there. All right, so brilliant transparent color that can be diluted with water. So you've got this really intense concentrated and it's easy to dilute with water uh, to varying hues. Uh, and that uh, makes it a little different, especially in the liquid form, you don't need to activate it with water. So pans, mm -hmm. you definitely need to activate. Even tube color, you need to activate a little bit with water. The liquid water color is easily uh, altered with small amounts of water and is more immediate as a mm -hmm. result. Uh, it's available in a lot of different forms, so you've got the bottles that have the actual uh, liquid in it that you can use out of a palette or out of the bottle itself, and then we have the pens and the markers, the brush pens and the markers that we're going to look at today too. So it, it's really versatile in that way. Uh, they're really valued uh, for their color strength, uh, for the reasons that we mm -hmm. talked about, uh, being dye-based, uh, and they're very versatile. Uh, you can use them in a lot of different ways, so you can use them in airbrush, for example. Uh, you can uh, use them uh, with a variety of watercolor ticks. There really isn't any technique other than lifting that these don't lend themselves well to. So lots of good ways. Fountain pens, nib pens, calligraphy, we're going to use some of those, uh, give some examples of those today as well. So let's talk about some of the features of Equaline specifically because there's a whole family of mm -hmm. liquid watercolors out there. Uh, so we have a gum arabic binder, so it's the same binder in all traditional watercolors, so these are completely compatible uh, with uh, all watercolors. Uh, the bottles, the brush pens, and the duo markers have the same color system, and we'll look at them when we're uh, doing in person, but there are numbers on each of these, and so all you have to do is match up the pen with the bottle or the pen with the pen uh, to find the same colors, right? That's convenient. Yeah, so it's yeah. super convenient. Uh, they are best in class for adhesion, so even compared to other liquid watercolors, the adhesion of the Equaline is, is really excellent. 
Um, they're all transparent colors. Most watercolors are transparent, but there mm -hmm. are some variations. Um, all of the liquid watercolors are transparent. We have one exception. We have a metallic. Okay. Uh, and that one's actually pigment based. Yeah, I was gonna um, say I've I've gotten uh, there was one watercolor that I had in my palette, uh, oxide of chromium. Yeah. That is a very opaque color. Yeah. yeah. But that's not a liquid watercolor. Right. It's a it's a panned one. Right. So that makes sense. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So all uh, completely transparent, and I would say they are all staining too. Mm -hmm. And we'll see some of that when we're working with them. They're very fast drying. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, uh, color uh, makes it very convenient, especially if you're journaling or sketchbooking. You can be working, especially with the brush pens, mm -hmm. and then when it's time to go to lunch, you know, close up and not worry or have to wait. Uh, of course, depends on how much water you add to it, too. Uh, they're excellent for light to dark watercolor techniques because they're so transparent. You can really build some wonderful veils of color, and we're going to do an example of that in the demo. Uh, they work well in combination with other watercolors. I've mixed these with our Rembrandt and our Van Gogh watercolors and done different techniques back and forth. You can actually add some of those colors to the liquid in the palette to create some really wonderful variations. I've done that with the specialty pigments a lot, like oh, cool. the uh, metallics. Yeah. Yeah, super fun. And kind of tint them a little bit. Yeah, exactly. I put the metallic paint down first, and then I drop a little bit of liquid watercolor in it and changes and shifts mm. the color. Yeah, really, really That's fun and pretty. dramatic. Uh, they thin really easily with water, and you're going to see that working with them today. Mm -hmm. uh, they just are what I call color hungry, <laughs> <laughs> or thirsty, you could call them. They're super thirsty. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no odor to these, too. That's one thing I really like. I mean, there's no harsh chemicals, mm -hmm. and, and that's more specifically talking about the pens. Mm -hmm. People are always looking at pens, worrying that there's some harsh chemicals or things like that used, and yeah. there's none in these pens, no odor, and they're safe to use for all ages. All right, demonstration time. All right, so now we get to make a big old mess. <laughs> Thank you for everybody for, for sitting through the presentation. Hopefully yeah. there was some fun information. That was good information. I mean, there's a lot of things that, especially as an artist working with watercolors, uh, those the details of how they function and what it can do, I think that's so important for us as artists to know. We have a question, though? Uh, Firstly, everybody was really excited about the where's and why's and how's because that's not always the easiest to understand and you made it really accessible, which was awesome. Um, secondly, how many colors are in the Ecoline range? So there's 60. 60. 60 okay, colors. That's a lot of colors. 60 colors in the bottles and 60 colors in the brush pens. And the Duo Tip are brand new this year and there's 32 colors uh, in that one. And there's a bunch of sets too. There are actually 28 different sets in the brush pens. Yeah, crazy, huh? That's crazy. That's <laughs> we'll a lot of some, color. And, well, actually, <laughs> let's let's start out by looking at some of the materials okay. on the table here. Yeah. So we've got what we're, yeah. we're going to be working with today, which are some of the bottles of okay. the liquid watercolor. We have the primaries here mm -hmm. uh, to work with. And then I match those. And remember, I mentioned the color system. So here's the brush pen. Uh, and you All can right. see the number on them. 337, so, 337. Here, actually, I'm going to do this. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So it's that's very how we know. Too. Oh, geez. I'm, I'm out of practice. There we go. There's the number. <laughs> There's the number. Um, let me get the glare off of it. Yeah, so you guys can see that number is consistently on the brush pen and the, uh, the bottle. Yep. yep. So there's the, the bottle. There's our brush pen, which mm -hmm. has a really nice uh, brush tip. Uh, I really enjoy working with this. You can get some great variation of marks, and we're going to play around with that today. I'm very excited about that. And then we've got the new uh, Duo Tip, which is actually marked. We've been we've been having fun. They look like little bull's heads. <laughs> yeah. And this little bull's <laughs> head is the bullet tip. <laughs> There's the bullet tip, and then the the uh, the uh, healthier uh, bull head over <laughs> here is actually the chisel tip which That's a funny. lot of different angles that you can create there. So these are new, and we're going to play around with those. Ooh, I'm very excited about that. And for those That's of you who are tip. anxious for the giveaway, let me show you what you can choose from. So we also have this big set of the uh, colors, primary, secondary, uh, and the black and, and, and uh, neutrals in there. So that's one of the, the possible prizes. Another one of the possible prizes is this big daddy, 30 pens of the brush Ooh. pens. Oh. I volunteer as prize winner. Yeah. <laughs> Look at this way. There yeah. we go. So there's 
Yep. All the colors in that All one All the right colors. There. And this comes with a blender, too. There's a blender that's part I of think this. I saw yep. that. Yeah, right there. Yeah, so, so if you don't a... have a water source with you to blend colors, you can use that. How cool is that? All and right. then these are some of the sets uh, for the new duo tips uh, I'm so right there. About these. Isn't that fun? Yeah. Oh, those are fun. So no big sets of these yet. Um, okay. This one has all the primaries and secondaries, and then these are some curated sets. So is this another, another uh, prize? This is another prize option. Okay. So your choice. So we'll pick three winners, and then uh, they can pick uh, uh, their prize. All right. And then we're working on the Equaline paper. Um, it is a 140-pound paper. Uh, it's kind of a bright white. I would say this surface is similar to like a, a vellum. Yeah. It's not a cold press, it's not a hot press, it's more like a Bristol vellum type of surface. But it's a ni nice heavyweight paper uh, and it works really well whether you want to do some expressive type of lines or detail type of work with your watercolor. Right. Also just realized there is a rainbow zebra right here, which if you guys remember, I did Deborah the Zebra as one of my uh, <laughs> videos. Perfect. Yes, Perfect. Watch me that make... was all planned. That it, was yeah, all planned totally. just for this. We coordinated. All right. So, all right, so let's do some do some fun yes. stuff. We got a few other tools here and kind of introduce those as we go. So we took the uh, liberty mm -hmm. of pre-planning here and we taped off. Uh, I don't know how well you can see that. Some little we'll squares see a little bit here. Like that. So you don't have to do that at home if you're going to try to replicate these, but I did it just so I stay organized, right? Yes. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. We're going to start with the liquid watercolors themselves, and then we'll move okay. into the brush pens in the next. So when you say liquid watercolors, you're talking about the I'm ones talking the about the bottles. Yeah. Gotcha. So these are the guys we're going to use here. Okay. Uh, and the first so. thing I wanted to show real simply is just some of the direct ways that you can use it. So with a brush or with a pen, uh, you can work right out of the bottle. So okay. I've got the bottle here. It's got a nice little uh, uh, pipette on it. Uh, but I'm going to put a little bit into the palette here. Okay. And doing that and too also actually, allows yeah, me to mix water with it. Pellets, pellets, pellets. I'm going to keep mine kind of off to the side, and you guys probably aren't going to see that much just because we're limited on table space. Um, so. But we had to do this together. You yes. Know? Yeah, so. I get to play with those flies. Absolutely. I mean, and I'm, I am familiar with the... Um, the liquid water color in the bottle, but I have not used the duo tip or the uh, the brush pen yet. Oh, you're in for a treat. I'm you're very excited. All right, so you can just dip. We're going to start with the dip pen. Okay, okay. Uh, or you can uh, drop it uh, into the nib if you're a calligrapher. Uh, and you can see here, Rita. we just get nice kind of lines. So you can see the kind of level of detail you could get with this, working with it almost as if you were working with an ink, right? It's hard to hold that and scratch this into it. <laughs> and you can see the this level of saturation of the color. Oh yeah. I feel like I'm using the ink up very quickly. Go ahead and <laughs> add some of the red in here. So I'm gonna actually doing a pulling a, a Jeff and wiping it off on my apron. Absolutely. I never do that. <laughs> Jeff actually had an offer to purchase his apron. <laughs> yeah, yes, absolutely. I know. You can see which hand I'm usually cleaning my palette knife or brush with right there. Ooh, look at that yellow. Yeah, Holy isn't that lovely. a great yellow? That is a wonderful yellow. These are really I, wonderful yeah, primaries. So. Look at they mixed. That's fun. Awesome. And so, you could yeah. mix colors together in your palette and, mm -hmm. and create variations, even if all you had were the primaries and didn't have any of the other oh, colors you with you. You could really lot. get a lot of great colors. Yeah. So let's just go with a brush and we'll just uh, just use the uh, watercolor by itself. We're not going to add any water, so we should get... I'm going to, actually, you know what, I'm going to make, I'm going to make a mix of the blue and the red because I want to, I want to mix. I want to make a purple. I'm going to swirl that around a little bit. So I've just laid down some color, and that's the color all by itself. Now I'm going to kind of just go into it with some water, and you can see Ooh, that was how like nice. One, yeah. One drop of the blue. That is lovely. I'm going to do one more now. A little bit more blue. I'm I'm, I'm gonna, more playing with the color. Over I'm going to follow suit here. I'm going to mix it on the uh, actual on the surface there. So. There we go. Ooh. So you can get quite a lot of variation yeah. with 
yeah. lights and darks, great value, great mm -hmm. color mixes. You can see how the dyes, uh, like I said, are thirsty. Mm -hmm. They really uh, flow well. Oh yeah, you can get quite a lot of color there. That is wonderful. And then the last thing on this first square, and working directly with it, is you can draw with this pipette. Oh. So you can just kind of get your pipette full of color and you can slowly bring out and create fun marks directly with the pipette. You can see the variation that I'm getting and part of that is the pressure that I'm applying and then how much of the watercolor I'm pushing out of the pipette as I'm going. Yeah, so, so as I was dragging mine, time. I'm not squeezing that um, the the pipette, uh, I guess what is the name pipette, for this? Yeah. Pipette, uh, oh geez, I don't know. Squeezy? <laughs> the <laughs> squeezy part. Yeah. yeah, we've got someone in the YouTube chat asking how these are different from acrylic inks. Number one, they're resoluble, right? Because Absolutely. Water. It's permeability is the prime thing. So acrylic inks have essentially the same binder as acrylic paint. It's an acrylic polymer resin. And so when it dries, it's permanent. So when acrylic inks are dry, there's no re-wetting it or reworking it. These have the gum arabic binder, which is the same as a traditional watercolor. So even after this is dry, I can go back into it, re-wet it, and reactivate the color. Let's say you have a final piece and you want to seal it somehow. What would be your recommendation? For so that? there are different types of spray varnishes that you can use over watercolor. And this is true with traditional watercolor, too. You just have mm -hmm. to be aware of color shift. Whenever you put one of those varnishes over the top of it, it can make the colors change a little bit. So never do it on your finished masterpiece. You know, Try <laughs> it on the corner of some scrap to yeah. see what it does. Um, but those are available, and of course, a lot of watercolor artists just put their work under glass uh, to protect it, so because mm -hmm. they don't want to alter the finish or the look of the, fin the final piece. Great question. That's how I, that's how I frame mine. All right. All right. So, so. let's let's pull some color, uh, okay. which is a, a fun technique that's very common with watercolor. So we're going to get uh, uh, my pipette here, and I'm going to just put a little bead of color down. And I'm going to use this flat brush first, and I'm going to get it wet. I'm not going to get too much water in it. Okay. Um, but pulling watercolor is that technique where you kind of slide up to it and then pull the color out. I'm going to slide up and pull the color out. And the great Ooh. fluidity of this color just makes it beautiful for this technique. Oh, that is fun. So that's that pulling is super color, fun. and you get so you have that nice edge, and you're able to work it in these different gradations and washes. I'm going to do uh, another one here. So I'm doing there. Oh look, there's that fly. He came back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have this <laughs> one fly. Resist. that's just saying hello every day. Uh, so I'm going to lay out some of the blue here, and so I did that with the flat brush. This one, uh, I'm just going to do with uh, my round brush. Because pulling color, you can be a little more organic with it too, right? I can yeah. pull off things that can be very detailed. Oh, like a little tree. Yeah. Kind of a, or, you know, even since you're using blue, it kind of reminds me of like a ocean, like, you know, those coral that grows on oh, yeah, trees. Yeah. Now, do we have a question? We have a couple. All right. Number one, mm -hmm. are, the, are these colors difficult to pick up? And I'm going to assume that will vary depending on the pigment in... Well, they are all what I would categorize as staining colors. So they do not lift as well as a granulating because watercolor or a pigmentous. Exactly, yes. exactly. So okay. here, just to, to show, we've got mm -hmm. some color that's over here. It's still mostly wet. <laughs> so I'm going to go in and see if I can lift it out. Now, I can certainly yeah. reactivate it mm -hmm. and get some color to spread out. So it does that. Um, but you can see the edge that I'm leaving there. I'd have to really work on that to get so. that to disappear. I'm going to do so. They definitely a reactivate, um, but I would not say that they are excellent at lifting. If you went right into it so. while they were still wet, you'd be able to lift a lot of it. But I, I would say that's one distinction between these and a traditional watercolor. The, the lifting techniques can be a little more challenging. Rewetting. Um, so the permeable nature of it. Yeah, so you can get some of so, it. Out. Yeah, and but that's it's always going to have a stained area. Yeah, I was going to say, that's just me dropping a little bit of water on there, letting it sit for a second, and then taking a cotton rag and then just literally dabbing it up and not scrubbing. And I can lift a little bit, but it's still going to have that right. stain. It's still going to yeah. have a stain. Because it yeah. dye based absorbs Pick back. Think of your phthalos and those colors that are in traditional watercolor lines, the staining uh, mm -hmm. aspect of it. These are going to behave a lot like that. Mm -hmm. So, what about light fastness? 
So light fastness is one of the uh, uh, challenges with all dye-based colors. Mm -hmm. So dye-based colors are what we consider to be fugitive. Mm -hmm. They're zero to ten years. Pigmented colors are going to be good to excellent, which can be up to a hundred plus years under museum-like conditions. So I wouldn't recommend these if you're creating your masterpiece that you want to hang on the mantle for generations. Where these have the uh, advantage are for folks who are digitally reproducing their work or photographing their work. You're getting a much truer a feel for the color and the contrast of that. Today a lot of work exists on social media, right? Where we're putting it on Instagram, we're putting it on Facebook. Selling and there prints. you're gonna see, yeah, like today, and you can see uh, right now on the screen how vibrant these colors yeah. are. Um, and uh, some artists are looking at more ephemeral types of works to begin with. So it really depends on what your goals are as an artist. Mm -hmm. Okay, a couple more questions that have popped <laughs> up. Uh, how do you clean the brushes and palettes uh, with after using these, and are any of the colors metallic? So, um, same cleaning process as with any watercolor. Uh, all watercolor uh, is essentially water soluble, uh, so you're going to be able to do a little soap and water. Depending on the fibers of your brush, you may see mm -hmm. some staining, and that's true with some pigmented colors as well. Um, but uh, as far as getting the paint and the binder out of them, it's really easy. Soap and water, and then of course any brush cleaner that's out there, a lot of great brands are available and those work really well mm -hmm. uh, also. And there is a metallic, there is a gold uh, yes, is. in the equal, and that's it for now. So we might see some new ones added down the road. And it's the only color in the line that's opaque. Well, I mean, with the gold, yeah, it should be, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that would make sense. Do we have any more questions before we keep going with our demo? Not at the moment. Okay. Oh, wait, yes. Are you using watercolor paper, cold or hot press? Sorry, it just popped up. Yeah, we are using uh, Ecoline paper, or Ecolina. Ecolina. Uh, here's the paper. It's so. um, kind of in between. Yeah. Um, so it's um, 140 pound. Actually, would, here, so if like you... Well, if you guys go to that, um, here, I'm going to put this over here. If you go to the side camera, we should be able to do a side um, a side shot of that, and you can kind of see more of the paper texture. Um, I it's liken not it to a Bristol textured. vellum yeah. surface. If, if, the, if you're familiar with Bristol illustration board or illustration paper, um, there's a plate and there's vellum, and vellum has a little bit more texture, and that's what this is like. So yeah. it's got more texture than a hot press would be. Um, but not the same kind of a texture as a cold press, so kind of in between. Mm -hmm. But it really well suited uh, for the liquid, but especially for the brush pen and the markers. But you can use these on any watercolor paper. Any paper that you would use traditional watercolors with, these work great on. Yeah. So you don't have to have a special paper for them. All right. All right, so now we're going to drop in some color. So that means that we got to get the surface of this paper wet. So I'm going to put down a nice... I'm going to bring my water closer because I'm a mess. <laughs> nice coating of water. <laughs> and and we're going to see how well... Yeah, cover that whole right. area. And we're going to drop in some different colors. Um, you know, one of the considerations in all watercolor techniques is typically we go... Um, I'm getting mine light to dark, and I'm going to follow that same principle. So you can see how well the color dispersed in the water. I just put a little drop of each and then immediately uh, fanned out. And so now I'm going to go over that with a Ooh. little of the magenta. You get a, I'm do a little bit more better yellow. kick of it. And look at how nice that, that jumps out. Mm -hmm. So this is just dropping in color is the name of the technique. Uh, we're creating blooms is another, another word for it. So part of the wonderful nature uh, of all watercolor, and it's kind of exaggerated here, is this ability for it to disperse in its vehicle. Uh, and we get some nice colors uh, and nice uh, actual mixtures and optical mixtures, too. I love the edges that we get. Mm -hmm. And at the end, I'm going to show you a trick to exaggerate this effect dramatically, which will be really fun. I made a puddle. A very <laughs> colorful puddle, but it is a puddle. But yeah, this is Look this at the, is the wonderful part. greens that are mixing on the edges. That's what I love purple. about this. Yeah, yeah, we get uh, those nice mixtures of okay. violet. It almost looks like an ultramarine. Then. Yeah, Whoop. going off the page, off right. the page, okay. All right, so now we're <laughs> going to do some washes, which is a very traditional uh, technique for watercolor. Again, we're going to wet the surface. All right, again, pull the water closer to me. All right. 
maybe a little less water on my page this time. <laughs> I'm going to have just a giant puddle of watercolor everywhere if I'm not careful. So I'm going to do a gradated wash or close to that. So that means I'm only going to go into the color at the beginning. Okay. And I'm going to come across the top with my color. Ooh. And then I'm just going to keep on going without returning. So I should get a slight gradation as I go along. And it's also pulling the color down uh, as well as I go. I'm going to put a little bit more. I'm going to work with this purple that I got going on here. And so, I'm going to put a little bit more blue in there. Again, the, the dispersion on these is really nice. Get a nice uh, effect on the wash. And then just for fun, I'm going to drop in some of this red and create a variegated wash. Ooh. And with a different color at the bottom. And that gives us that nice mixing of the two colors at the edge. And if you were like me and you put way too much water on there, it will follow your tape edge. And we're working Just, flat too. If we were working yeah. at an angle, gravity would be on our side as well. That's true. But you Which can see is the a nice, good technique to be practicing nice anyway. You know, yeah. if you guys do get this, this is, I feel like, a good way to kind of familiarize yourself with the product and kind of what it does. And that's so pretty. Well, my hope by seeing this too, and if you're trying this at home, is that you're getting a real sense of the vibrancy of these colors. Uh, the handling of them, um, they, they are so easy to work with and color dispersal, yeah. Quick question, is the giveaway open internationally? Um, we can only ship to North America. Good question. I'm glad we asked because we didn't specify that. We but yeah, we're only, we're only able to ship to Canada and the U.S. Sorry, guys. Thanks for tuning in Continental internationally, US? though. What's that? Continental U.S.? Continental U.S. Yeah. Right. You know, actually, I think we can ship to Alaska and Hawaii. Yeah. Just uh, not Puerto Rico or Guam or yeah. Samoa. And I'm sure there's one more Guam. Guam. All right. I'm going to put this, put this we're gonna down. We're going to put this aside because now we're going to switch. Yay. And we're going to get into the brush pens and the duo tip right. markers. Let me uh, make sure to close my bottles. Before I get that <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> you know, these well, are actually very sturdy bottles. They are very sturdy they, they bottles. Will, they will move but, versus um, tip over, but that doesn't mean they won't. Yeah, I have a tendency to grab them by the top. <laughs> and if I do that and it's not on there, <laughs> that'll be not so fun. Okay. All right, so brush pens uh, first. Uh, whichever color you'd like, I've got the magenta. And I want to show you some of the different marks you can get with the brush pen. Okay. Uh, so you can kind of see the these are, I'm so fun brush pens and, and great touch to these. There's the tip there. And I'm yep. just going to do real light pressure and you can see a nice fine line I'm getting here. Oh, that is very fine. I can change the pressure as I'm going and go from thin to thick. And if I put it on its side a little bit, I can get a nice broad area of color. So those are some of the different marks you can make with the brush tip. Uh, now let's do the duo tip and I'm going to start with the bullet tip. Uh, so this one doesn't require that level of touch. So the brush pen takes a little practice to get used to using it. Oops, I'm gonna actually um, use the bullet tip uh, is a nice solid uh, nib that you can work with and uh, regardless of the pressure I'm going to get this nice consistent fine line. Even on its nice side there's not really a variation. Mm -hmm. uh, I am going to show you guys the difference between this is the brush tip and the top one is the bullet tip. So you guys can really see the difference in the, the shape there. But yeah, the, the, I think the firmness is really the Yeah, they're the real solid. Um, for younger artists uh, and folks just starting out, uh, they're pretty durable too. You're not going to immediately squash it, uh, so it does handle a good amount of pressure. So when I eventually bring some home, my six-year-old is not going to destroy Not going to destroy it. them. <laughs> and another great thing, because of these are a gum Arabic binder, if uh, the, the six-year-old leaves it out and it dries, it's not ruined. All you have to do is dip oh. it in some water and it comes back to life. That so. is a selling point right like there. dried out Sharpies. So no sure dried out Sharpies. Sharpies. No more dried out, <laughs> dried out markers. So here's the chisel tip. Mm -hmm. So um, the wide angle. There you go. And again, uh, you don't need to have this great touch to get the line. If you yep, come uh, on the other side of the chisel, 
you can get a nice fine line. And then there are variations of that depending on how you hold the pen. So if you're a calligrapher, you've got a variety of edges. And I can kind of show that in an example of I turn and create some multiple lines. I'm clearly not a calligrapher, but it's okay. <laughs> me either, me either. I got it thin. So those are some of the different marks that you can get uh, with okay. a different uh, Sorry, there's tips. another set of these over to dear Frida and she just gasped with joy. <laughs> <laughs> so now let's look at how these overlay. And this is okay. one of the things that's really fun with them. So I'm going to mm -hmm. take the brush pens first and I'm going to create some areas of color. Okay. So I'm just going to create a yellow area here. Alright. i got to be different. I'm going to go this way. <laughs> Then I'm going to do the magenta. I'm going to layer mine in. All right. All right. And then, and then blue instead. My blue. Gosh, that is such a bright. The colors are very, very intense. I hope that's coming across on the camera because they are massively intense. They are. They're great. And, the, and there's, it's real comparable uh, mm -hmm. to the brush pen and the, the concentrated liquid watercolor. Yeah, the colors are consistent, which is if you're working uh, on a piece and you need to go between the two of them as an illustrator or somebody doing a, right. you know, There's real consistency. Work. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to take the duo tip now and I'm going to use the chisel tip side and we're going to go over these colors so you can see how they optically mix. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I've gotten this question in a few different versions, and I've got a couple other questions as well. But number one, can you blend with the pens, overlap, or will they destroy and contaminate the lighter colors? Just wait. You can blend. Okay. You can blend with the pens. Great question. So I'm going to go right, right over now? the top. Yeah, I yeah. need the chisel tip. Okay. There we go. Your answer shall be, or your question shall be answered. So here I'm going to pull the yellow right through there. Ooh. I'm going to pull the yellow right there. So you I'm can see go. the optical mixture. I'm going to go the opposite way. Now I'm going to take my magenta duo tip Woo. and I'm I will going to say, do the same thing. I did just activate that and pulled it through, so I will say it You'll get a little that. bit of the color. Yeah. The wonderful thing about all these pens is they're self-cleaning too as you draw with them. So if you mix them into another color, as you draw with them, the other colors come out. Like this? Yep. Ha ha! Yep. And now I'm going to grab the blue. Can the markers be refilled with the bottles? That's a good question. So, um, the manufacturer recommendation is no. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to share with you exclusively here there is a Explosive hack. Contest? There is a hack. This is why we love this show. So, you can see the, the brush pen and, the, and uh, this top actually does screw off. Mm. Now, it's not intended to be refillable. Um, but you can see there's also another tip at the other side of it. So if you were to run out, my advice would be go buy another one. But if that's not possible and you do have the comparable bottle, you can use it to refill. But there is a difference. So there are flow enhancers added to these pens that enable them to be drawn through the nib. Oh, uh, that's okay? So if you put this all by itself in there, what's going to happen is that could gum up. So to mitigate that, you'd need to add some type of flow enhancer or just water uh, in there. Like a gum um, arabic? A, gu a gum arabic would work, um, a glycerin, a oxgall, mm -hmm. something that's going to help it move through that tip a little bit better. Um, but that can take some practice and, and uh, you know, figuring out the ratios of, yeah. of your mixture. So it can be done, um, but... Um, no. We don't list it as a feature or recommend it. I will say the the brush pen unscrews easily. This not because so much. that's yeah. that's not really an unscrewable, and this one has a, a cap here, and it does not really unscrew. I will point out the uh, blender in the sets, and which is available on OpenStock too. It is refillable and meant to be refillable Okay. Um, because this is something you want to be able to take with you time and again to blend your colors so you can see actually the threads on the transparent and you can put gum arabic in this or just water oh, wow. uh, and use this as a blender over and over again so the blender is intentionally meant 
uh, to be a refillable tool. Very cool. So kind of like those, uh, you know, watercolor brushes that have a reservoir. Right? Yep, that it makes can, sense. It can function just like that. Nice. All right, so here's our transparencies. The thing I love about this is, is you get a different color depending on which color you lay down first, which makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. For those of you who are watercolor painters, yeah. you know how this I'm happens. Saying. So here we have the uh, blue over the red, and here's the red over the blue, and we get two different types of purple. This is more mm -hmm. of a red violet, more of a blue violet. Uh, here we've got the red over the yellow and the yellow over the red. This is a little more subtle, but uh, I don't know how much of it's picking up on the camera, but here in person you definitely see kind of a vermilion color as a result. Yeah, my, I pulled the blue through mine, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I made mud, but uh, you can definitely still see there's a bit of like a, an orange. I hope that's coming across, but yeah. And here's the two greens, uh, yellow over blue and blue over red, and again we get uh, a different result. But you can see the wonderful transparency and the benefit of the dye colors to be able to layer multiple uh, colors and create optical mixtures that way mm -hmm. rather than blending the color together. And each and every one of mine, because I made a lot of mess with when I took them through, uh, they came clean within one little scribble. So, nice and easy. Will the blender tip get dirty or will it self-clean like the other pens will? It will self-clean and it's easy enough just to brush it in some water to clean oh, out the color too. That's good to know. Yeah. Yeah, will since tip, it's a blender. Will the tip still stain? Um, it's going to stain over time, but you can get it clean so that the color isn't transferring to the paper. Um, but the tip will stain over time. Yeah, repeated use. So like really sometimes your our brushes do the same, same with thing. the brushes. Yeah. 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 Um, that might get stained, but it doesn't mean that your brush is actually dirty. All right, so next we're going to draw into a wet surface. So you can do a lot of the fun wet into wet techniques that you're used to with watercolors by using these pens as well. So if you wet your surface. I am, I need more arms, more hands, more arms. And then use, uh, I'm going to use both the brush pen and, and the uh, duo tip here. Mm -hmm. So you can pull your pen through. And you can see you can get that nice bleed of color. So you can still create some wonderful variations. Uh, here's the chisel. It's nice tip and the soft duo. instead of being like a, a harsh edge. It's so juicy. Yeah, lots of color. I love it. It's still it just blending out just a little bit still. And so some of those variegated washes that I was doing uh, with the brush, uh, mm -hmm. if you wet your surface and use these brush pens you can get some of those same kind of looks. Sorry, I got a big puddle of water on mine again. <laughs> so for somebody who's sketching or journaling, or if you're an urban sketcher and you want to do some techniques that have that kind of look uh, and you're using these, all you have to do is wet the surface a little bit. How cool. Oh, that's, that's so Aren't pretty. they fun? So fun pretty. Blades. All right, so blending. So somebody asked, can we blend these together? So I'm going to show you a couple fun uh, uh, ways to blend. Uh, one is to actually mix the two colors together on purpose. Uh, since they are self-cleaning, easy clean, you can actually take the two and transfer a little color. So I'm going to transfer a little of the magenta onto this yellow tip green. on purpose. Go. So you can see how I've kind of colored the yellow tip. Okay. And now the lines that I create are going to slowly transition from the magenta back to yellow. So you could create a calligraphy uh, at, that starts with one color and finishes with another. I'm going to do uh, the same now with. Oops. I'm going to do the same now with uh, the duo tip. Okay, that is satisfying. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Oh Look yeah! Look at that. Isn't that great? Actually, you know what I'm going to do with this one. So if you've got both the liquid uh, and the, the marker here, you can, well here I've got some out of my palette, you can dip these in to the liquid watercolor. And now again, I'm trying to think of the longest words I can. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. So you can see how I'm getting, I went from blue, Ooh, look I'm getting at this that. And if I had more room, I would just keep going. Actually, that I could is... go like this. Let's get really crazy here. Getting crazy. Now I'm picking up some of the yellow mm -hmm. and some of the blue as I go. Ooh, that is so fun. How cool. All right, and then I'm going to actually take this because I want to see exactly how, like, yeah, it's, 
It's I really had quick. I had that covered in the blue ink, and it's totally clean now. Yeah. yeah. So they clean it really easy. That's so insane. these kind of ways to to blend the colors uh, are really infinite. All the traditional ways that to to blend exist, and then this fun way so of nice. using the colors together. That is so so fun. All right. All right. So one last fun uh, example of some special uh, techniques. Uh, the first we're going to do an alcohol drip. Now a lot of folks have seen this and I want to show it in kind of its traditional way. Uh, I'm going to wet the surface a little bit here. Okay. And I'm going to get in with some of my liquid water color. I'm going to do a variegated wash here. Do a little blue. Come back at it. Just keep using my purple. So many of you have probably seen this technique, and we actually have some alcohol here in a couple different ways. I'm going to just put some on my brush. I think you're going to do a dropper, or were you going to do the mister, or no? Um, I have because we have the isopropyl alcohol. Oh, cool! You're going to do a little, little spray. spray bottle? Fun, yeah. Fun. So I can I can do something a little different, but I want to get different color down here. So I'm just going to tap the alcohol into it and you can see the wonderful textures you get. So I'm probably going to make a mess. <laughs> so to no confirm, the colors you are using are all primaries and they are lemon yellow, sky blue, or cyan, and magenta? Yes. Thank you. That's fun. Isn't that cool? That is so much fun. Now this is so, going to be interesting when we contrast it to this other technique that maybe uh -huh. you haven't seen. So here we're putting the alcohol on top of the color okay. and wherever the alcohol hits it gets lighter. So it's, it's literally pushing, pushing the, pigment the pigment apart. Yeah. So now what we're going to do is we're going to flip that on its head okay. and I'm going to take my brush here and I'm going to put the alcohol down and just going to brush a pattern into the paper. And it's going to be almost invisible. It's like I'm going to go invisible. with the You're going again. to do a little spritzer? Okay. That should be a fun texture. All right, so I brushed in the alcohol right into the surface. Okay, and I spritzed mine. So I'm going to go back to my flat brush here and I'm going to get some okay. color. All right. And now I'm going to go pull the color it. over the top of it. And everywhere where there's alcohol, Ooh. you're going to see a resist. I'm going to make a bit of an orange. I want orange. One Having of the things that, that I think is interesting is it isn't always... Um, I have still got some wet. Here, I'm come in the rain. There you go. There we go. What? Isn't that cool? How cool is that? So it could be like that secret handwriting, you know, you're leaving messages for other people in, in alcohol on the paper, and then you bring it to life with the Echolina. That is fun. Fun. But it's a fun way to use it. Oh, that turned out really nice. Really fun. So it kind of flips it on its head, right? So where you put the alcohol here, it's actually darker. And here it was lighter. And the reason yeah. for that is that the alcohol is disrupting the sizing in the paper and making those areas more absorbent to color. How fun. That is, that's very, very cool to, to see. And I feel like for people that try to get a lot of texture to their work, mm -hmm. this is a really fun way yeah. of doing that. Yeah. And it's very easy and direct, too. Mm-hmm. You could even do a stencil. I've done a stencil before where I laid a stencil and then used a sponge what? and put the rubbing alcohol over the stencil and it's kind of this invisible image and then you brush over it and the image comes to light. So it's a real fun project for kids. Yeah, yeah, and that's that would be something that would be not terrible. Again, make sure you have ventilation with the isopropyl alcohol, of course. Yes. Especially with kids. But yeah, now you get a good amount of texture. That is so yeah, fun. Yeah, real nice color. So it's, for me, as an illustrator, this would be something fun that I could then either scan in and digitally layer or even yeah. do a piece on top of this opaquely with either gouache or acrylic or whatever it may be. Well, these and work really, really well fun. with inks too. Yeah. Um, I use microns a lot with them. So you can start in micron and brush these over or mm -hmm. you can use the micron over the top of it. So you could do some really detailed drawings Ooh. over this kind of a background. And Although actually, really well. now that I'm thinking about it though, because these do reactivate, if I were to paint on top of this, it would start kind of... If you paint on top, it's going to lift the color. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But with something like a micron or an ink with a pen, mm -hmm. you're going to be Black fine. and white yeah. kind of uh, pen and ink kind yeah. of work. There's That'd actually cool. one of our videos. Um, we have lots of inspirational videos uh, for these, and one of them shows an artist who starts with the liquid watercolor, goes into the brush pens, and then finishes uh, with fine tip and micron. How cool. Yeah. 
How oh, cool. All right. All right, so what this else next we one. So we've all seen the watercolor with the salt sprinkled into it and yeah. it absorbs the color and creates one texture. Um, but what folks don't know is if you use a salt water wash, you can dramatically impact the way that the color distributes. So we did okay. that drop in, uh -huh. folks remembered. Yeah. And the color kind of slowly eased out. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to show you what happens when you mix just your regular salt. And actually, you're going to mix yours. Okay. I have mine pre-mixed here. How much salt to water? So kind on of average, I like to start with a tablespoon of salt per cup of water. Question. Quick question about the paper. Um, what are the fiber contents? So these are a um, pulp. Uh, base paper, so it's not a cotton paper, it's not an archival red paper, it is acid free. Uh, and it's all responsible forestry uh, paper as well. Awesome. So, Royal Talents is one of the leaders in sustainable manufacturing art supplies. Alright, so I didn't measure. So you didn't measure, just eyeball, I dumped it, which is vigorously. <laughs> so you can play around with it. The more salt, the more dramatic this effect is going to be. The less salt, the more subtle it's going to be. So what we're going to do is... I'm thinking there's a lot of salt in here. Like and this is just water, so um. <laughs> Ooh, that's salty. Yep. That's so salty. this is our salt water, and we're going to take that and apply that uh, pretty generously to the surface. Not too much. We want to see the reaction. Okay. Uh, when we drop in the color. So this is the salt water, and I'm going to start with the magenta. Now you remember how it kind of slowly uh, bled out. Watch what happens when I add this to this water now. Ooh. Do you see how fast and dramatic that was? All right, let's see uh, how mine does. <laughs> all the metal salt I put in there. Uh, so what's happening is you're changing the pH of the water, but you're also creating more buoyancy. So think of floating or swimming in salt water compared to fresh water. You float mm -hmm. much easily, much more easily. The same thing's happening here. Uh, the pigment is hitting the surface, or in this case the dye and the gum arabic, and it's just kind of catapulting across the surface. And I think it creates really dramatic, uh, kind of, I call them tendrils, uh, uh, or legs of the color yeah, as it blades. Yeah, you can see it kind of Yeah. So this, this is a salt water wash. So a salt water solution brushed onto the paper, and then the, the color dropped into it. And you get that rapid dispersal and these really fun, unique edges. And My you can, yeah, is, you can brush through that, I... too. Ooh. Dropping it back in. That's fun. I mean, we that's, dropped color too, but yeah. you, we could have brushed the color through and it would that's, have done the same thing oh, with that cool. rapid distribution of color across the surface. That's fun. That's a lot of really fun things that we could be playing with. All right, so what are we doing in the last one? So I've saved the most fun for last. Okay. I'm going to use some straws. Paper have straws. Some fun. Save the turtles. <laughs> Paper straws. Paper straws. We're yes. being good here. Um, so uh, because this color is so concentrated, you don't have to add water to it to do these techniques. You get really vibrant results. So I'm put just a drop of the color right down on the surface. I'm going to take my trusty straw and I'm going to blow. <laughs> I told you, the most fun for last. You're not joking. Oh my gosh, that went everywhere. <laughs> That's what happens when you laugh into the straw. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to do that uh, towards the camera. <laughs> of course, you can be more controlled. I'm going to be more controlled here. And you can guide it, too. Okay. <laughs> I was like, I'm not sure if I'm going to get watercolor on my face. So hours of fun and entertainment with this this technique. That is super fun. So yeah, kids, adults, <laughs> uh, your next uh, cocktail party. There we go. Right, Depending on the see. colors you choose, this could be some great like greeting card backgrounds. Ooh. I'm just taking a the back end of a brush because I don't want to get the watercolor soaked into my brush, and I'm gonna just dab it on. That's fun. Isn't that fun? That is very fun. Ooh, look at what you did. That's fun. It is. It's super very fun to cool. do. It's super easy to do. It doesn't matter <laughs> how well you draw. If you've ever picked up a paintbrush before in your life, you're going to have fun uh, mm -hmm. blowing around this color. 
uh, and, and uh, a great result too, with little effort, right? And try not to, you know, Ooh. attack your neighbor like I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. This is an arts art show, so you know, getting art supplies on us. Is well, not the reason for taping it too, and if you, and this is really a choice, right? You can mm -hmm. be uh, as wild and have the soft uh, edge, but. If you're doing some kind of cards or something like that, you know, you can tape off the edge and get these nice, sharp Let's see what we got edges here. to your colors. The beauty of, oh, I got still a bunch of water on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I'm excited about this one up here. Let's see, let's see. I like this, it's kind of like the final reveal. It turns it from uh -huh. that crazy experiment into something that Looks, looks intentional. Like art. Yeah, looks Ooh. like art. All right. And while we're peeling off the tape here, do we have any more questions or concerns that I'm going to have uh, watercolor in my face? There's like a 20 <laughs> second delay. So let's oh, I know. That That's exactly why I figured I'd need. ask. Ooh, that's fun. That is so fun. It is. I like yours. It's very satisfying to have it have like very clean edges. You can you learn know? to control this technique too and do some oh, really yeah. detailed pieces. But part of the fun of it is not knowing what is going to happen mm -hmm. and just going for it, right? <laughs> That's, uh, I did have a friend of mine in, um, I want to say it was college, we had a, an assignment to play with inks. And I think that's one of the things that she had done because we were required to do like a fish illustration and she had done this really tightly rendered with all the scales and everything. But then for the background, she did this crazy blow with the, um, the straw kind of technique and it was a really fun juxtaposition of like the very organic shapes and a tightly rendered, almost mechanical kind of with the fish scales yeah. looking very per like perfectly placed. It was very cool. Well, and that's one thing so. too. We're doing these as individual techniques, but most Yay. pieces of art or most things that people are going are combining different elements of all these different things that we've shown today. Oh yeah, especially with the what you said, sixty colors. So these come yes. in. Yes. So lots of choices. You know. A lot of options. The. Uh, Bottles uh, of the liquid water go 60 colors and there are three different sets. Uh, the brush pens have 60 colors and 28 different sets. Uh, and then there are 32 colors in the uh, new dual markers and I believe seven sets. Nice. All of which are available on jerry'sartabama.com. Awesome. These are so fun. Aren't I really like fun? the... Oh yeah, that is beautiful. The, this I turned out got... really nice too. Yeah. I, I love how that yellow is kind of, it's like this pool of light. Very fun. Very fun. I don't do abstract art, but this makes me really want to play with it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, was that everything? That, that was we everything. Yeah, awesome. just questions. Uh, questions yeah. now. And I think uh, we're probably good on questions as far as the ones that are coming through right now. But if you guys do have any other additional questions, even if you're watching this in the future. Last question, what's the tape? What's the tape? Oh, we gotta get, we gotta do questions. we gotta do the quiz too. Uh, that's true, we do. Um, but the tape is just the white um, the the pro artist tape in white. Um, I don't believe this comes in. Do we have these in other colors? I think it's just in white. Um, but it's it's a pH neutral tape, so it's really good for your paper. Not going to introduce acidity through the uh, the adhesive that's on there. That's why it's my go-to for tape whenever I use it. Um, but if you do, uh, what I was saying though is if you guys are watching this in the future, or even those of you who are going to be re-watching this on Facebook, because uh, you can watch it on YouTube, uh, make sure you type your questions in. We'll make sure to keep track of them and we'll be answering them even in the future. Um, but so now we've we got a quiz. A oh, and one more announcement too. Mm -hmm. I'm here in Raleigh, mm -hmm. and I'm going to be at Jerry's store tomorrow in Raleigh from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. with all these same materials. Mm -hmm. So if you are local and want to come down to the store tomorrow from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., I'm going to be there playing. I've got some free samples I'm going to give away. Uh, I'm going to raffle off some sets there as well, you and you'll be able to play with all these materials. That is and, amazing. Uh, we can have fun uh, if you're able to make it. That would be great. So Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, show up and 
show some love to Jeff and, Yay, and come experiment down, with some, some fun things. And if you're not that local, just take a, a road trip. We have some great <laughs> sights to see and restaurants. And <laughs> Jeff. I'm going to be exploring some of that myself. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. All right, so, All right, so giveaway, giveaway, though. So I got three questions, three winners. Um, here's the first question, uh, and that is I listed three categories of pigments. Three categories of pigments. The types of pigments. So just type in those three different categories uh, of pigments, and I'll give it a second. And I guess I can say the, the answer in a minute, right? And then you can pick the person who uh, got it correct we'll, first. We'll do that uh, in an announcement. You'll do it in an announcement yeah. separate. Because okay. we will allow, uh, for everybody watching, uh, especially because there is a delay, we'll allow it uh, up to 15 minutes after we finish airing uh, for them to type in their questions, and I'll pull the winners tomorrow. Perfect. All right, next question. Um, I listed... Uh, the differences in the working properties of dye-based colors and pigment-based colors. Give me two of those differences. There were seven. So give me two. Ooh. Good question. Those All are right. good questions. All right. All right. And this next one is going to be really great more of a fun question things. to really test how people are paying attention. Mm -hmm. I'm excited about this. So at the very beginning of my presentation, I said uh, the date in which Royal Talents was established. What year? was Royal Talons established. There you go. Hope you're going to have to go back to the beginning of the show. <laughs> yes. Like I said, I will give you 15 minutes to type your questions into the chats. Uh, we will be pulling them um, as far as, you know, a winner, and then we'll be getting in touch. Uh, but I will be announcing them probably tomorrow uh, or, well, within the week. Um, we'll be pulling the winners, and then we'll announce the winners that way uh, by either going live or posting it on either and once Probably we Facebook. have the winners, we'll let we'll yeah. reach out to you, and you can tell me then which of the three uh, product lines you'd like to have for your price. Yes, awesome. Well, Jeff, thank you so thank so you. much for being here in person, especially it is because so cool. it is so cool. This it is way better to have you here because then I get to play with a lot of We've been talking like, about it now for three years, so I know it's great to finally it's do been, it. It's been well well uh, waited for and definitely worth it. So. Everyone, make sure to show Jeff some love. Hit that thumbs up button. Uh, subscribe if you'd like to, you know, see more videos like this. And uh, we will see you guys next time. Uh, but uh, the next week, I am going to be having a Zoom meeting, so it's going to be on Facebook only, and that is going to be with Golden. We are going to be going over some really fun, oh, fun. Uh, projects there. Uh, but are you are you officially ready? I'm officially ready. Because we're going to have to oh, dance man. off. We got to dance off. Yeah. That's right. Um, which means. Woo, uh, you guys also get to see. <laughs> you guys also get to see uh, a hidden, hidden secret. <laughs> I'm standing on a box because I'm short. Do we dance off in different directions? Uh, no, just this way because okay. there's a lot of, a lot of okay. equipment over that way. So we will see you guys next time. See Bye. You everybody.